The signs stood ready and waited patiently at the entrance. Over the past few days I have spent a lot of time to ensure their flawless creation. Now came the most difficult part. Climb the stairs, enter the bedroom, quickly remove the bed linen, with difficulty detach the mattress from the double bed, and carefully lower it down the stairs. Half carrying, half sliding down the hallway, past the front door, and onto the lawn in front of the house adjacent to the street. Back in the house I climb the stairs again and throw off the boards and bed linen. I carefully lower them down the stairs and take them outside, throwing them in a pile next to the mattress. Looking into the bedroom once more, I forcefully dismantle the side railing and quickly take them outside. Glancing at my watch, I notice that time is flying fast, which means that I need to hurry up urgently. The headboard and footboard obediently follow me, and already at 4.35 p.m. the bed is easily assembled. Now let's move on to the kitchen table. Its lightness allows me to easily shift and carry it, maneuvering from side to side and carrying it at an angle through the door, and eventually install it next to the bed in the yard. As the hours ticked by, I carefully rolled up the catchy carpet in the living room, attaching it to the rest of the things neatly laid out in the yard. While installing the signs, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction when I saw the price on them at only $4.55. When there were only 10 minutes left before my wife's arrival, I went out into the middle of the street to admire my work. The sight before me was truly breathtaking, almost to the point of tears. The marital bed, the kitchen table, and now the carpet are three places that have undoubtedly witnessed my wife's repeated meetings with her lover over the past six months. Looking at the carefully calibrated signs, I couldn't help but notice their impeccable location. Slowly and purposefully, I absorbed their messages. Towering proudly above the furniture, a majestic plaque announced that these once cherished items were now on sale. They were free and no longer needed within the walls of this dwelling. She boldly called on those who are able to endure the bitter stench of infidelity and broken promises to help themselves. There was another sign with a weighty truth hanging above the bed. It said that on this very bed, my wife had repeatedly violated her sacred vows, recklessly renounced our union, and entered into intimate relations with her lover. Twice a week, for a painful six-month period, this bed witnessed their secret trysts, and just this afternoon they indulged in another ordeal, exacerbating the pain. The scent of their bodies lingers on the sheets, reminding me of their intimate encounters. There is a sign above the kitchen table boldly stating that my wife and her lover often indulged in passion on this very surface, often several hours before she cooked dinner for me. Similarly, there is a sign on the carpet indicating that my wife and her lover loved to indulge in pleasures on this floor covering. I carefully stapled a large photograph to each sign, capturing the moment of their unfaithful union on the corresponding piece of furniture. And finally, the fifth sign, imperceptibly located right behind the table, stands as a silent witness, conveying a message of betrayal. I found out that my wife's boss is Greg Allen, a married man with three children who works at Mitchell Price and Allen Realty. His wife doesn't seem to know about their affair, but I guess she'll find out soon. Looking around, I noticed that a crowd of neighbors had gathered around, who were curious to know what was going on. Some even invited their friends to come and watch the unfolding events. It was a tense moment, because my wife, at the age of 37, could return home at any moment. The police called to detain me on charges of promoting obscenity. I greeted the assembled crowd with a casual gesture and entered the house, quickly closing the door behind me. At exactly 5.05 p.m., I saw my wife's car rounding the corner at the end of the block. Watching the growing crowd gathered outside our house, talking and laughing animatedly, fixated on something in the yard, she carefully steered her car towards the house we shared for ten years. Finally, she stopped, her gaze fixed on the unusual look of our furniture. There were posters in the courtyard of our house that demanded my close attention. 
Especially striking were the large photographs placed in a prominent place, capturing intimate moments between her and her boss, Greg Allen. Their faces were full of desire and satisfaction. Despite the noisy crowd of about 40 to 50 people and the barrier from the window of her car and the window of my house, her agonized cry of despair, no, oh God, no, made its way through the commotion. Eventually, her gaze shifted from the sign to the front window of my house, where our eyes met. She exuded a deep sense of sadness as we looked at each other, silently acknowledging the gravity of the situation. Her face was pale and ashen. Tears were streaming down her cheeks, like a silent plea for an explanation. And yet I kept repeating the same question in my mind. I watched her mournful face for a while, and then turned away, closing the curtains behind me. It became obvious that I needed to talk about the events that led me and my wife Sherry to this devastating moment. Let me introduce myself as Jack Meyer. Fate brought Sherry and me together in our freshman year of college. A mutual friend suggested that we meet, and from the very first meeting I was fascinated. Sherry wasn't an ordinary beauty, but there was something captivating about her. She exuded an irresistible charm, was both sweet and attractive. Her stunning blue eyes and flowing blonde hair, gracefully falling to her shoulders, were mesmerizing. Her body, perfectly proportioned, had a tiny waist that thrilled me. Unknowingly, she had already captured my heart, and the thought of not conquering her did not even cross my mind. Sherry and I went on a romantic trip, and in just a few short weeks we became a devoted couple. After a month of our relationship, we shared an intimate moment, making love for the first time. This experience defied any words. It was unlike anything I had encountered before. I was deeply attracted to Sherry and craved every inch of her body. Despite the fact that we were not immaculate, our intimate relationship was still inexperienced, and we enjoyed exploring each other's bodies. Our experiments knew no bounds, and each new venture quickly became our favorite. It's safe to say that our love for each other was deep, perhaps as deep as love can be. After graduating from university, we tied the knot and settled in our first home a cozy apartment in Van Nuys. Sherry, having obtained a realtor's license, began her career at one of the most respected agencies in the area. Thanks to my engineering degree, I managed to get a lucrative position in a reputable electronics manufacturing company. So we started a life that I thought was perfect. Over the next 13 years, we enjoyed a wonderful existence together. At first, we lived in a condominium, but growing incomes allowed us to purchase the long-awaited house of our dreams and start a family. Our first blessing came in the form of Shelby, who is now eight years old, and then Ryan, who joined our lives two years later and is now six years old. Sherry and I cherished these two children immensely. They were the center of our lives. But I'm at a loss to figure out what brought us to the current situation. If only I could give you an explanation. I wish I could say that I noticed subtle signs that something was wrong, but I was completely unaware. My existence revolved around an idyllic bubble of unconditional love and unshakable trust in my wife. But an unexpected twist of fate was necessary to enlighten me on the subject of truth. This twist of fate happened when our daughter, Shelby, got sick at school. Shortly before noon on Thursday during a staff meeting, my phone rang. It was the school nurse who informed me that Shelby seemed to have the flu. I regretfully asked the nurse to contact my wife, as I could not leave the meeting. The nurse informed me that she had tried to call Sherry at her office, but was informed that my wife would be unavailable for the rest of the day. After receiving no response at our house, she left a message and then called Sherry's cell phone, but was redirected to voicemail. Since I urgently needed to pick up my daughter, the nurse contacted me. I quickly apologized to my colleagues and hurried to Shelby's school to pick her up, and then drove back home. When we arrived and I lifted the garage door, an unfamiliar car took my usual place next to my wife's car. A wave of surprise swept over me, causing a lump to form in my throat, and my stomach twisted with anxiety. 
I tried to calm myself down by denying the possibility that my beloved wife might be involved in an affair. It just couldn't be. Still, the presence of an unfamiliar car behind a closed garage door left an unsettling feeling. Something was wrong, and I felt an urgent need to investigate, protecting my daughter from possible revelations. Please stay in the car for a minute, Shelby, I asked her. But why? She complained. I just want to go to bed. I understand, honey, but I think the exterminator is spraying our house for bed bugs right now, and the fumes could make you feel even worse, I lied. It was the first time I lied to my daughter. Let me go and check first, and then I'll come get you. Daddy, what's the matter? What is it? She asked, worried. Nothing, Shelby. I'm totally fine. I'm just really worried about the smell in the house. He got me, but don't worry, I'm fine. I calmed her down. Leaving Shelby in the care of her grandmother, I left. I informed her that I would pick her up in a couple of hours, but I decided not to tell my mother any details of what I witnessed. Instead, I just asked her to keep an eye on Shelby until I got back from work. Although I was tormented by the desire to return home and engage in a fight with this duo, I realized that a simple confrontation would not be enough. I wanted to take revenge, to do something that would forever tarnish my wife and her boss. Back at the office, I started coming up with plans that would ruin their lives forever. It is important to note that the electronics manufacturing company I worked for had several divisions. As a senior engineer in the medical equipment division, I found myself in the same complex with a division specializing in commercial security equipment. When I arrived at my office, I instructed the secretary to make sure that I was not disturbed for the rest of the day. Having resolved this issue, I quickly dialed the phone number and contacted my colleague from the security department, Dan Taylor. Dan was not only an outstanding engineer but also a close friend since his student days. After informing him that I urgently needed to meet, he said that he was on his way to deliver some blueprints for copying and would be able to meet with me in about 30 minutes. I informed my secretary that Dan could enter my office immediately upon arrival, and indeed, he fulfilled his promise by knocking on my door just 20 minutes after our phone conversation. What's going on, Jack? He asked in a worried tone. Come in, Dan, and please close the door, I said. Wow, it looks like you've lost your closest friend, he remarked. It looks like it is, and I desperately need your help, I confessed. Is there anything I can do to help, Jack? What's going on? What is it? he asked. I just found my wife and her boss engaged in intimate activities in my house in my own bed. I shared with a mixture of disappointment and disbelief. Damn, Jack, you've got to be kidding, he exclaimed. I sincerely wish it were so, I sighed. I had to pick up my daughter from school, and when I arrived home there was an unfamiliar car in our garage. Sneaking inside I found them in our bedroom right on the bed. It was hard to believe, but unfortunately it was true. Jack, no one should go through such a situation. Did you confront them? No, you didn't. Although I wanted to, my daughter got sick, and I couldn't risk her witnessing what was happening. So I asked her to wait in the car and I calmly left after witnessing their betrayal. I took Shelby to my mother's house. As for what I plan to do next, I honestly don't know. But I understand that I need proof. In particular, I need audio and video recordings of their actions the next time they engage in such activities. And that's where you'll come to the rescue. We need discreet security cameras and microphones, something inconspicuous. I can strategically place them in different rooms of the house so that everything that happens is documented. Jack, I think I can help you with this case, but you may wonder how I can be sure that it will happen again. It's very unlikely, Dan. They have openly discussed their regular participation in such events over the past six months. And although I can't confirm if they always meet at my house, I'm willing to bet that they do. None of them can afford the hotel expenses, and since her boss's wife stays at home, the only available option is my house when I'm at work and the kids are at school. After a short conversation, we got down to business. 
Dan mentioned that he has access to the latest beta line of wireless miniature cameras and microphones that can be easily connected to my laptop or home computer. In addition, he has a compact voice recorder that I can discreetly place under Sherry's car seat to record all the conversations she may have while driving. Although only her point of view on the conversation would be recorded on it, having something was better than having nothing. I expressed my gratitude to him, and informed him that I would pick up everything from his office the next day. The thought of going home that night terrified me. I didn't know if I could meet my wife and pretend that nothing had happened. I came to the conclusion that the best way out would be to make Sherry believe that I was not feeling well, which, in fact, was true. I picked Shelby up from her mother and arrived home to find Sherry busy cooking dinner in the kitchen. As soon as she noticed Shelby next to me, she immediately flew into a rage. Where have you been? What is it? She asked anxiously. Why didn't you tell me that Shelby was sick? I just got a message from the school nurse on my answering machine. The school tried to contact you, Sherry. But unfortunately, for some reason, you weren't there. They tried to contact you at your office, but they were informed that you were not there. Then they tried to contact the home phone and left a message. They even called your cell phone, but the message went to voicemail. My God, I probably accidentally turned it off while I was showing it at home. I haven't had a minute of free time all day. Although I couldn't help but wonder if she was too busy with her boss to worry about her daughter, I didn't say anything. Sherry hugged Shelby tightly, expressing her sincere apologies, and then helped her to lie down on the bed. Despite the fact that my wife sometimes behaved unfriendly, I could not deny that she sincerely loves her children. But I understood that I had become an obstacle to her happiness, and I was determined to fix it soon. After putting our daughter to bed, Sherry returned to the kitchen to make soup for her and finish cooking dinner for the rest of the family. Feeling my discomfort, I confessed, I don't feel well either. I think it would be better if I sleep in the guest room tonight in case I'm contagious. Worried, Sherry gently put her hand on my forehead to check for signs of illness. You seem to be sweating a little, my love, and your complexion is quite pale, she remarked quietly. Indeed, I couldn't help but think that pallor and perspiration are the inevitable result of discovering a spouse entering into an intimate relationship with another person in our own bed. I decided not to say anything, turned away and went up the stairs. My original destination was the master bedroom, a place I didn't want to go, but I needed shaving supplies, a toothbrush, and clothes for the upcoming workday. With great effort, I forced myself to step into the room. A light breeze came through the open window, dispelling the remnants of the smell of passion, and the bed was immaculately made. She must have changed the sheets. It was excruciatingly painful to look at all this. All that occupied my mind was the image of her boss performing intimate acts with her, accompanied by her unequivocal declarations of loyalty to him. This caused a surge of anger in me akin to a rising wave, but I suppressed it. Keeping my composure was crucial until I could unleash the wrath of hell on both of them, a promise I was going to keep. I prepared the necessary supplies and retired to the guest bedroom, closing the door behind me. Undressing to my underwear, I climbed into bed, feeling that my body was numb and lifeless. Tears threatened to burst out, but I resisted the urge to let them loose, I had an important assignment, and I couldn't let my emotions interfere with it. I lay in the dark all night, unable to sleep. Eventually my wife came into the room, having just finished feeding and putting our children to bed. Trying to maintain my facade, I pretended to be asleep. She gently passed her hand over my forehead, and then quietly left the room and closed the door behind her. Sherry usually took the kids to school, so I tried to wake up early, take a shower, and leave the house before she woke up. I'm sure this unusual behavior has raised a number of questions for her. I would just tell her that I had to make up for the hours I missed yesterday due to illness. To be honest, at this stage I no longer cared about her opinion. All I wanted was to break out of what I once thought was a wonderful marriage, based on eternal fidelity, 
honesty, and devotion. It's incredibly heartbreaking how wrong I was. Arriving at work before all my colleagues, I brewed coffee and began to build my strategies. It was obvious that I would have to give up our shared credit cards. I decided to transfer 50% of our shared checking and savings accounts to another bank solely in my name. In addition, I planned to change the will, life insurance and beneficiaries of the 401k, excluding Sherry from them and including only Shelby and Ryan. It seemed to me that it was such a small task to eliminate the 13 years that we spent together. Deep down, I expected it to be more difficult but I knew it was necessary. I also understood how important it was to find a competent divorce lawyer to protect myself from any unfair treatment by Sherry. After all, divorce happens without fault in this state. Although adultery would not affect the financial settlement, it could help me achieve joint custody of our children. Despite Sherry's dismissive attitude towards me, she was a devoted mother, and I did not want to deprive her of the opportunity to participate in the children's lives. My desire is to maintain a significant role in their upbringing through joint custody. In order not to dwell on the painful aspects of our love life, especially the humiliation of my wife extolling her lover's superiority over me, I consciously tried to distract myself from my thoughts. I knew that indulging in such thoughts would only lead to self-doubt, which I wanted to avoid at all costs. I knew that the ability to do this would come later, but when it finally happened, it would most likely devastate me. After making a list, I contacted Dan's office. He was on site and assured me that he would provide everything necessary by noon. He even offered to accompany me and help with the installation so that I would understand how to use it all. As I was trying to focus on clearing papers from my desk, my cell phone rang. After recognizing Sherry's name on the screen, I answered after three calls. Her voice always calmed me down, but this time it only foreshadowed a surge of intense anger. Hi dear, how are you feeling? What is it? She asked, her voice full of love and concern. I'm still a little sick, I admitted. If only she knew how much worse it was. I'm worried about you, honey. You left this morning and I didn't even have time to check on you, she said, and there was concern in her voice. Yes, I have a lot of things to do and little time, so I had to come early, I explained. Please, Jack, take care of yourself. I can't bear the thought of anything happening to you. You, Shelby and Ryan are my whole world. Her words startled me, but deep down I couldn't help but think that her actions didn't always match her words. I reassured her by telling her that I would be fine and that I should just forget about it. But if you're ready for it tonight... I have an idea how to make things better for you. The realization hit me like a brick. I couldn't believe how blindly I believed her lies and fell for her tricks, but not anymore. It's time for her to face the consequences of her actions. I've been patiently waiting for the right moment. I replied, of course, we'll see how I feel. It was obvious that she did not fully understand the gravity of the situation. My dear fellow, you are not interested in getting what is rightfully yours. I'm not indifferent, Sherry, but I have a lot of worries right now. I'll see you tonight, and I'll be home by six, honey. If you need anything, just call me. I'll be in the office all day today. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I contacted Dan, and he assured me that everything was ready. He advised me to meet him at the entrance to the loading dock. The two of us worked on the installation and by 3.30 we managed to install and test everything. After that, we installed the software on my home computer. I have created a secure folder to collect and protect all data recorded by cameras and microphones. We set up surveillance in different parts of the house, including the living room, kitchen, guest bedroom, and, of course, the master bedroom. In particular, we have equipped the apartments with four cameras strategically positioned in such a way as to capture almost all the actions taking place in them. In addition, we discreetly installed a camera and microphone in the master bathroom, anticipating the possibility that after intimacy, the couple would take a shower together. To ensure smooth operation, all devices were set to automatically activate when motion was detected, with cameras and microphones activated. 
everything was ready, and I was fully prepared for the upcoming events. That night was the most difficult test of my life. The idea of feigning illness again was incomprehensible to me. After we had dinner and the children fell asleep, I dutifully followed my wife into our bedroom. There I turned away from her and pretended to be asleep. Sherry seemed concerned about my behavior because we usually hugged before going to bed. Despite this, she clung to my back and hugged me. Worried, she asked, Is something bothering you, my love? I reassured her, No, Sherry. You've always satisfied me. It's just that sometimes I doubt if I'm enough for you. She asked perplexedly, Why do you say that, Jack? I have always believed that you are more than enough for me throughout our time together. Just the thought of something happening to you brings great sadness into my life. As long as you're with me, I don't need anyone else. You are the epitome of the perfect lover, and you have always handled this role with ease and will continue to do so. Although it's hard to understand sometimes, Jack, I wonder what's bothering you. Nothing, Sherry, I replied in a tired voice. I'm just tired. I closed my eyes, trying to find solace in my sleep. A few moments later I heard Sherry's soft sobs echoing through the room, but I couldn't find the strength to empathize with her. I couldn't help but wonder if her tears were caused by a sense of shame for her actions, or if they stemmed from perceiving my words as unkind. Once again, I woke up before her and took the opportunity to discreetly put the recorder under the seat of her car. I meticulously studied the footage and audio recordings, finding solace in the fact that our nighttime activities were captured flawlessly, even in the dim lighting conditions in our bedroom. When Sherry got out of bed, she showed a slight irritability, saying that some of my remarks made the night before had caused her mental discomfort. After a quick kiss on the cheek, her mood changed to cheerful. I suspected that this change was related to her upcoming arrangements with her boss. After preparing a cup of coffee for her, I informed her that I would spend the whole day in my office. She mentioned that she had a lot of houses to show in the afternoon, and expressed confidence that she would be able to achieve a significant sale. But she assured me that she would be able to pick Shelby and Ryan up from school. After saying goodbye to her and giving her a gentle peck on the cheek, I headed for the garage door, but then Sherry's voice stopped me. I am pleased to hear you express your love for me every morning, dear. I'm sorry for assuming that you already know how deeply I care about you. I've been preoccupied with various thoughts lately, which made me neglect this important gesture. I understand how important it is to hear these words from a partner, and I regret that I did not attach importance to this. Please remember that I will not forget, and I promise to make this a priority. As I left, I couldn't help but think about how I would express my love to another person if I ever found someone I could trust enough to truly fall in love again. Having received information from Sherry that she would spend the whole day showing at home, I couldn't help but assume that she would be spending time with her true love. I sincerely hoped that my assumptions were correct because I was tired of playing games. Desperate to put an end to this catastrophic situation, I decided to act. In the morning, I managed to do some work in my office, constantly checking the time on my watch. Towards noon, I informed my secretary that I would be away for several hours and put my plan into action. I looked after the company's van and parked it in front of my house, patiently waiting for the events to unfold. It was almost one o'clock in the afternoon when I noticed Sherry's car pull up to the house, open the garage door, and park in its usual place. From the way she got out of the car and entered the house without closing the garage door, I concluded that she was either going to leave quickly or was waiting for someone to arrive. Ten minutes later it became clear that she was really waiting for someone, as the same car that I saw during their previous meeting drove up to our entrance and drove into the garage. When he got out of the car and the garage door closed behind him, it became obvious that he easily got used to my role as well as to my wife's body. I couldn't help but notice their audacity when they met in my own house, in my own bed, to indulge in an illicit affair. Their arrogance only reinforced their belief that they were invincible, 
and would never face any consequences. It seemed that they either convinced themselves that they would not be revealed, or simply did not care about the possible consequences. But they would soon find out how wrong they were in both cases. The truth was, that they had been caught. I made sure that neither of them cared deeply, and after receiving the final proof of his wife's infidelity, I could no longer hold back the tears. For 13 years I firmly believed that my beloved wife would never be unfaithful, just as I would never betray her. And yet, as the tears flowed down my face, doubts began to creep into my soul. Was he really excellent in bed? I noticed that he was no different from me. Perhaps he had the best looks, although none of us could boast of outstanding attractiveness. Why would she voluntarily risk ruining both our marriages if she knows for sure that I will inform his wife about their affair? I had a strong desire to enter their house and run into them, but for what purpose? I would have caught them in the act, but I already did it once without their knowledge. Would I get satisfaction from a violent encounter with her lover? Maybe, but then I'll probably end up in jail, and frankly, none of them are worth it anymore. All I could think about was how this nightmare would affect my children and his. I was ready to destroy him, just as he had done to me. Around 2.30 p.m., they seemed to be done, as the garage door opened and her lover drove out in his car and drove away. Just 15 minutes later, my wife did the same, closing the garage door behind her. Expecting her to return with the children by 3.30 p.m., I quickly parked in the garage and hurried to my home office. I didn't have the opportunity to view all the recordings made by the cameras. I just wanted to make sure that the evidence I needed was securely stored on my computer's hard drive. It's only been 10 minutes, and I've become a witness. Although it was not an exact copy of their previous meeting, it was undoubtedly frank. Their escapade began on the very kitchen table where I regularly ate. They amused themselves by having an intimate relationship countless time, wondering if I would ever understand that I was having lunch exactly where he shared such moments with her. Subsequently, they moved into our shared bedroom, but this scoundrel more than once suggested that she move into my daughter's room, just for a change. My wife was furious and flatly refused, she was already annoyed that she allowed him to bully her husband, but she firmly decided that our children's rooms were inaccessible. It turned out that she has some kind of moral standards, although not in relation to me. Their romance resumed in the bedroom. I couldn't help but notice that neither of them expressed love for each other, but my wife persisted in praising her boss as the most skillful lover she had ever met. Confused, I tried to figure out the motive for their last act. They moved to the carpet by the fireplace in the living room and again began an intimate act. After their meeting, it seemed strange to me that she did not bother to change the bed linen. But I assumed she would do it later, when she brought the kids home at 3.30 p.m. That would have given her enough time to freshen up the room and erase all traces, given that I usually didn't get home before 6.00. Knowing that the evidence I was looking for was safely stored on my hard drive, I turned off the system and left the house without bothering to look at the alleged mess still left on the marital bed. I've seen enough already. Despite the bitterness of my heart towards my wife, the disease gnawed at me from the inside. Soon this disease turned into boiling anger and deep-rooted hatred. A distorted smile appeared on my face as I considered the torments. I would put them both through for betraying them. When I returned to work, I told all the details that I had witnessed and overheard. My colleague, like me, was trying to figure out how Sherry, who always seemed so loving, could commit such blatant infidelity. Not only did she break our once sacred vows, but she also deliberately tried to belittle and humiliate me in front of her lover. She constantly reminded him that he was a better lover, more masculine, and the only one who could truly satisfy her. These thoughts plunged me into a deep and painful state of despair. I understood that I needed to overcome this agony in order to fulfill my mission to destroy their relationship. In search of advice, I turned to Dan for advice on finding a reputable divorce lawyer. 
he advised me to contact the law firm that our company used and ask if they could recommend someone suitable. Following his advice, I contacted one of the corporate lawyers I knew at the firm. He provided me with three names of divorce lawyers who have proven themselves well in protecting the rights of husbands. When I contacted the first lawyer, I found out that he is preparing for retirement and does not accept new clients. But the second lawyer agreed to set aside time for our meeting the next day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Having decided so, I decided that I would deal with cancelling credit cards, changing beneficiaries, and redistributing finances the next morning. When I returned home late at night, Sherry was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and our children were diligently doing their homework in their rooms. Dressed in a bright yellow sundress, she radiated a captivating beauty that broke my heart anew for a moment. Her beaming smile radiated an infectious happiness that seemed to stem from her usual afternoon euphoria. Hi, honey. How's my man doing? She greeted me, causing me to raise my eyebrows in disbelief. I hope your day was as wonderful as mine, she continued, leaving me curious. Well, my day was quite eventful although not particularly pleasant. I came across some intriguing discoveries that I didn't know about, I confessed. What made your day so fantastic? I asked. She seemed to be in an exceptionally joyful state, and I understood perfectly well why. I couldn't help but mention that an intimate meeting with the best lover in the world will undoubtedly brighten up any day. I made a sale, she shared. Her delight was obvious. Although this was the first deal this week, she expected to have another opportunity on Thursday when she showed other properties. With a note of disinterest, I noticed that it must have been her lucky day. Curious to know if anything else remarkable had happened, I asked if she had met any intriguing or unusual personalities. Her response was accompanied by a puzzled expression on her face. No, my love, the usual routine. My goal is to fulfill my work obligations and return home to spend time with my family. I understand that this is where your true feelings lie, I admitted with a nod. When I went up to our bedroom to freshen up, I couldn't help but notice that the bed linen had been replaced, and there was a refreshing scent in the room. While changing clothes, I noticed a small puddle of water on the floor in the shower, which I drew her attention to when I returned to the kitchen. Did you take a shower today by any chance? I asked. Her reaction was surprised, and the guilty expression on her face said a lot. No, of course not, silly. Why would I do that? She defended herself. I couldn't help but know about her intentions, but I felt insecure. We stood in the bathroom and watched the water constantly accumulating on the floor of the shower stall. I casually suggested that this could be the result of another clogging of the drain, which my wife agreed with. But I had a more amusing thought. Perhaps someone secretly enters our house for passionate dates and then takes a refreshing shower. When I shared this thought with my wife, she suddenly stopped her actions and remained motionless for several moments. Without turning to me, she continued to prepare our salad, focusing solely on the salad. My friend and my wife and I exchanged a knowing look, realizing that the water on the floor of our shower may have an unexpected explanation. You really have an incredibly rich imagination to come up with such ideas. I recognized this by calling myself Mr. Imagination, or perhaps even the owner of extrasensory perception. Sometimes it seems to me that I am able to decipher people's thoughts. If you can look into my mind, you will discover the great love I have for you. She tried to laugh, but it came out quite strangely. I'll be in my office. Let me know when dinner is ready. I informed her, and she looked at me with a worried expression on her face. Dinner was held in silence, without much conversation. Sherry seemed taken aback when I decided to take her usual place at the table, which made her reluctantly sit in my usual place, where a few hours earlier she had entered into an intimate relationship with her boss. Jack, you've always had dinner in this place at the table, why the sudden change? What is it? she asked her expression hinting at confusion. I answered casually, Oh, it's nice to change the situation sometimes and look at everything from the other side for a change. Perplexed, 
Sherry gave me an unusual look, after which she sat down at the table but hardly ate, instead aimlessly pushing food on her plate. While our children were animatedly discussing their day, Sherry and I mostly listened, occasionally inserting appropriate remarks. After we put the dishes in order together, I returned to my office to focus on the project. Looking through the footage of the day, I carefully selected suitable shots that could turn into exciting photos. The selected images were promptly uploaded to a special photo file, which allowed me to make large prints on my reliable Epson printer. After that, I carefully thought out the wording for the accompanying plates that were supposed to accompany the photos. All that remained was to consult with a lawyer to start the divorce process, put my finances in order, and wait for the next visit of my wife and her lover to my house. Sherry was already asleep, or at least pretending to be when I got into bed, and I was sure that by my actions that evening I had given her something to think about. However, it didn't matter. There's nothing she can do or say to convince me that I'm going to divorce this cheater. Besides, there was a small plus in the fact that I think I made her at least a little nervous. Although today was Tuesday, and she mentioned that she expects to make another deal on Thursday. So I took it as a hint that she and her lover would meet that day. I'll finish them off the same day. When the sun rose the next morning, I quickly jumped out of bed, took a shower and hit the road before Sherry woke up from her nap. I had a lot of things to do, and I longed to have enough time to do them. Although the meeting with the lawyer was scheduled for 3 o'clock, I had enough time to settle all financial issues. First, I went to the HR department, where I quickly changed the list of beneficiaries listed in the life insurance and 401k policies, replacing Sherry's name with Shelby and Ryan's names. The woman who was helping me met an unusual look, clearly puzzled by my actions, but I didn't feel the need to justify my actions to her or anyone else. The next step, I decided to cancel all our shared credit cards and issue a new one exclusively in my name. After that, I went to the bank and transferred half of the funds from our joint checking and savings accounts to another bank account issued exclusively in my name. I was aware of the importance of resolving the situation in our house, but I believed that the court would most likely allow Sherry to stay there with the children. Therefore, I decided to postpone any actions related to the house until I have the opportunity to discuss this with a lawyer. At 3 o'clock, I met with my lawyer, who turned out to be a pleasant person. He warned me that since I live in a state where there is no guilt, most likely my wife will get custody of Shelby and Ryan, and I will have to lose my house and half of our property even if I have proof of her infidelity. In response, I explained to him my approach to drafting the petition. Despite his doubts that I would be able to get most of our property, I assured him that there was no need to worry. I was sure that I could convince my wife to fulfill my wishes. Although he expressed dissatisfaction, he eventually agreed to my demands, assuring me that he would prepare all the necessary documents to hand them to her on Friday morning. In addition, I asked him to prepare legal documents to file a lawsuit against her boss, who intentionally played a role in the breakdown of my marriage. These papers were supposed to be ready by Friday morning, and I felt relieved. When I returned home that evening, I remained detached and calm when dealing with Sherry. I had reached a breaking point, and just wanted this ordeal to end, and I could move on with my life. Although I knew there would be a lot of pain and sadness ahead, I accepted that there was no turning back. Besides, I will finally share the burden of suffering with my unfaithful wife and her despicable lover. After a silent dinner devoid of much conversation, I retreated to my personal retreat, known as the Men's Cave. There, I meticulously printed out the photos of the lovers I was going to use, and skillfully made the plaques managing to complete all the tasks without any interference. In addition, I took the time to write a letter to Greg Allen's wife, in which I enclosed small prints of significant photographs selected for the posters. I also informed her that I have a lot of video evidence that I will readily provide if she decides to divorce her husband, just as I myself decided to end the marital relationship. A little after 11 o'clock, I carefully checked that Sherry had fallen asleep, and stealthily headed to her car. 
I reached under the seat, took out the recorder and rewound it to listen to the contents. Among the various business calls, there was one conversation, it seems, with Greg. I love you, the voice on the recording said. Thanks again for this day. Another voice answered, me too, I always miss you when we're not together. The excited first voice suggested, isn't a whole week together a paradise? The second voice agreed, yes, maybe we can arrange it soon. We can come up with an excuse to attend the realtor's convention together. The conversation continued and the first voice said with anticipation, you always drive me crazy. Yes, my love, just you. If it weren't for the obligation to periodically satisfy Jack's desires in order to preserve his happiness, I would devote myself entirely to you. Yes, my love, our plans for Thursday remain in force. I'm just as excited as you are. Goodbye, my love. Surprisingly, her words didn't hurt as much as before. Perhaps there was still hope in me. She didn't know that soon she would belong to him completely and forever. And the thought that I was just one day away from ruining their idyllic life gave me a sense of satisfaction. Revenge, I was beginning to understand. The medicine I had turned out to be incredibly strong. After replacing the tape, I carefully put the recorder back under her seat, desperately trying to capture at least some proof of the torment she would have to endure the next day when her world collapsed. I couldn't sleep that night, but not because of the pain in my heart, but rather because of the anticipation of what I wanted to see the next day. Sherry was still asleep when I left the bed for the last time, and my eyes were fixed on the woman who had once been my true love and the mother of our children. When I looked at the woman with whom I dreamed of living my whole life, I was overwhelmed by a wave of sadness. Tears welled up in my eyes when I realized that our intimate relationship had gone on the last flight. The thought that we would never experience gentle hugs again and would not have heartfelt conversations about our dreams crushed me. Our once prosperous future has now fallen apart. With a heavy heart, I turned away from her, doubting if she understood the consequences of my betrayal. She might have remained in the dark, but very soon reality would have revealed its price. After cleansing my body under a cascade of water, I left the monastery and headed to the nearest snack bar to satisfy my hunger with breakfast. I stopped by work briefly to tell my secretary that I would be out all day. Then I called Dan and informed him about the upcoming situation. He wished me luck, advised me to be careful and asked me to keep him informed of the results. Then I quickly popped into my lawyer's office to make sure everything was ready to serve my wife and Greg Allen the next day. Immediately after that, I contacted my wife and informed her that I would personally pick up our children from school. And my mother expressed a desire to take them away for the long weekend, since there will be no classes on Friday. I planned to pop home around 3.45 p.m. to pick up my clothes and then go straight to my mom. The cheating wife seemed delighted with the idea and seductively suggested spending the whole day in bed on Saturday. I just answered, of course, and ended the conversation. I got to the point where I couldn't stand her lies anymore. Taking my time, I eventually returned to my home. By 12.30 p.m., I had discreetly parked the car around the corner, looking forward to how the action would unfold. My car remained almost invisible, but I could clearly see any car pulling into my driveway. There was no need for me to observe the repetitive movements of the garage doors. My wife and her lover were predictable, and I learned their daily routine well. At exactly 12.50 p.m., I saw Sherry's car pull into the driveway, followed five minutes later by Greg Allen's. The trap was set, and I was ready to trap them both. Although I had to suffer because my wife and her boss were engaged in illegal activities within the confines of our marital bed, while I anxiously awaited nearby for their meeting to end, she lost the ability to hurt me. I was amazed at my own self-control, imagining all the actions that I knew they were doing. The feeling was akin to memories of a low-budget adult film, without content, but with a memorable climax. At 2.50 p.m., I was watching Alan, the disgusting man, 
drive away when his car pulled out of the driveway. Sherry, ten minutes later, followed suit, exuding an atmosphere of voluptuousness. It is noteworthy that before leaving she put on fresh lipstick. As soon as they were both out of sight, I quickly maneuvered the car into the garage and closed the door. I had important things to do and limited time to complete them. I went into my office and started going through the recording of the afternoon session. To my relief, the entire session was taped. Unfortunately, the recording also included hurtful insults about how much she thought his intimate abilities were superior to mine. Something has changed in me this time. The insults didn't bother me anymore. After making sure that the recording was safely uploaded to the hard drive, I devoted the next 10 minutes to collecting all the handmade signs with photos. Carefully climbing the stairs, I placed them at the front door so that they could be easily approached. After that, I packed toothbrush and clothes for Shelby and Ryan, putting them in the car. The only thing I regretted was that my upcoming actions would cause great pain to the two children I cherished more than anything in the world. But I found comfort in the fact that I was not to blame for the agony they would soon experience when they realized that their parents were no longer together. This burden was on their mother's shoulders. She made the decision to enter into a long-term affair and irreparably destroy our family. At 3.15 p.m. I went to their school to pick them up as soon as the last bell rang. It was with a heavy heart that I informed them that they would spend the weekend at grandma's. After I overindulged them, they were overjoyed. It took me 45 minutes to drop them off, and then I went back to the house to carry out my plan. And here we are again at the very beginning. A bed, a table, and a carpet were laid out on the lawn, accompanied by various signs, and curious neighbors watched what was happening. Sherry came home and was horrified to find out that I knew about everything. Surprisingly, I didn't receive any messages from Sherry that evening, although I expected it. Later in the evening, my cell phone rang, but when I picked up the phone, there was silence on the other end. An hour after Sherry left, the police visited me. Despite the sympathetic expression on their faces, they informed me that I had to remove the signs and photos. Otherwise, I will be charged with disorderly conduct and indecent behavior. Reluctantly, I removed them realizing that they had achieved the desired effect. Watching my wife's expression before I looked away, I realized that her life had gone into a rapid downward spiral. In desperation, I resorted to consuming a significant portion of a bottle of Maker's Mark that night, falling into an alcoholic stupor. Despite the fact that I woke up with a heavy hangover on Friday morning, I surprisingly felt a surge of strength. Although I was tormented by feelings of sadness and loneliness, I managed to suppress my anger and resentment long enough to make a plan of revenge on my unfaithful wife and her lover. Around noon, when I pulled back the curtains on the front window, a shocking picture of an empty room appeared in front of me. The carpet, kitchen table, and bed were gone, leaving only a bare mattress and sheets stained with evidence of their illicit relationship. I thought about getting rid of them or burning them later. The rest of the morning passed without incident. By three o'clock in the afternoon, chaos reigned. I was firmly convinced that Greg Adams's wife had received the letter and photos earlier in the day, as my lawyer quickly informed me of the successful delivery of legal documents to both Sherry and Greg Adams, as well as his assistance at their workplaces. According to my lawyer, he personally watched the tense scene unfold. Sherry, when the documents were handed to her, let out a piercing scream and collapsed on the floor, bursting into sobs. And Greg Adams, ignoring the upset Sherry, rushed around the office, hurling insults at me and even threatening my life. After a short absence, his partners retreated behind closed doors for a quarter of an hour. When they returned, they handed Sherry the last payment, and informed her that they no longer needed her services. At the same time, they handed Greg a check for his share of the partnership. When Greg refused to sell the company to them, they referred to a special clause in the corporate charter, which dealt with ethics of conduct and employee participation. 
It was this point that gave them the right and reason to sever all ties with both Greg and his partner. At the same time, the receptionist warned him about his wife's urgent call. She received the letter and the photos I sent and insisted on talking to him immediately. She informed him that there was no need for him to return home and told him of her intention to file for divorce the next day. Later, I learned from the husband of my colleague who worked at the agency that as soon as Adams was taken out, my future ex-wife was met with contempt. Everyone turned away from her. She lay on the floor, crying and moaning for 30 minutes. In the end, she gathered her strength and left the room. No one knew exactly where she had disappeared to, but the next day I received an alarm call from Sherry. Her voice was full of anguish as she asked about the whereabouts of the children and whether they were aware of the situation. After assuring her that they were safe at my mother's house, I clarified that I had not divulged any unsavory details to them. Expressing her gratitude, she asked for permission to take some of her belongings from our shared house. Without hesitation, I gave her the opportunity, asking only to tell me the time so that I could vacate the room for a few hours. But she craved more than just taking things. She asked if I could stay and talk to her. I told her that I had no words for her, which made her burst into tears again. She begged me for understanding, apologized, and stressed how sorry she was that she had hurt me. She claimed she couldn't control herself. It was hard for me to believe her, and I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of her apology. How could she expect me to accept her apology and believe that she never meant to hurt me? Did she really think that I would congratulate them when I eventually found out? I never wanted to discover this betrayal. She insisted that she loved me and had never loved anyone else. I doubted her sincerity, wondering how I could believe her after everything that had happened. You told your lover that you felt much more beautiful with him than with me, that he was the best man who could compliment you, and that every time we made love, you only dreamed that he would be in my place. Darling, I didn't say anything like that. What makes you think I could say such things to him? I have recordings of you saying things like that to him, Sherry, every single word. You told him that you would have to let me make love to you from time to time, so that I would be satisfied that I had everything, Sherry. All your words, every shame that you tried to put on me in front of him. You know, Sherry, you told your lover all the humiliating comments about men that you can imagine, but you directed them at me, your husband. I have nothing more to say to you. Nothing you say will change my feelings for you, no matter how small and insignificant they may seem. Jack, my love for you is unshakable and sincere. Please believe that I have always loved only you. I can't figure out what made me say those words to Greg, but you have to believe me when I say that I didn't mean anything by it. I was just trying to build his self-confidence because he was constantly complaining that his wife was belittling him. So let me make sure that I understand everything correctly. You were constantly tearing me apart in his presence. Did you intentionally start a relationship with Greg to raise his self-esteem and compensate for belittling his wife while humiliating me and my efforts in bed? Do you want to convey exactly such a picture? You seem to sympathize with his situation and, as a result, engaged in sexual relations with him over the past six months solely to give him a sense of self-affirmation. Jack, I never meant to hurt you or make these hurtful remarks. I really didn't mean anything by it. But if that's the case, then why did you decide to act like that? To be honest, I can't explain it, Jack. It just seemed wrong to me, and I allowed myself to be tempted to be involved with Greg. But please understand, it was a purely physical connection with him, and nothing more. They were just pleasant and intimate meetings. I had to clearly delineate our relationship, which has always been affectionate and pure. It's very frustrating for me, Sherry, to realize how long it took me to figure this out. I'm disappointed in myself for being such a stupid ignoramus. I don't have feelings for him, Jack. I only love you. Please, Jack. If you find the strength in your heart to give me the opportunity to fix everything, I will give you everything I have. I was incredibly stupid. 
I've always belonged only to you. It's always been you, Jack. You have to believe in it. I made a mistake, but this can't be the end for us. Let me prove it. I'm ready to do anything. Jack, I'm begging you, please change your mind. I'm deeply sorry, Sherry, but my feelings for you have faded. But I wasn't going to leave you. You're the one who left me. Your actions with him, as well as the constant humiliating statements addressed to me for more than six months, clearly indicate that you do not love me. True love does not want to hurt, harm, or humiliate anyone. Sherry, I find your behavior repulsive and disgusting. You're a nasty and evil person, and I'm looking forward to you disappearing from my life. Do you really believe that I will have a desire to have a relationship with you after you gave yourself to him and made a lifelong commitment to be only with him? Even if you were the last woman on this planet, I wouldn't lay a finger on your disgusting body. The only reason I'm talking to you is because of our kids. Do you remember Shelby and Brian? The children we brought into this world when we were still a family? You betrayed them too. I want to protect them from as much suffering as possible, but I have no intention of sparing you from everything. Moreover, I want you to experience all the torments that you have caused me. Both you and your lover Greg deserve it, and I want you to feel it deeply. Jack, why did you tell his wife everything? It was an incredibly unfair act. Unfair? Are you out of touch with reality, Sherry? The way you treated me and our children was unfair. So why on earth do you think I told her the truth? He destroyed my family by repeatedly having an affair with my wife. He took possession of the only woman in this world whom I considered exclusively mine and manipulated her into praising him and belittling my virtues. His wife had to find out the truth about the kind of man she married, a complete and utter loser. What she does with this newfound knowledge is up to her. They both have kids, Jack. Like me, Sherry, I have two children whom I intend to protect. I sympathize with his children, but it's not my fault that they have to face a future without a father. It's entirely his fault, and yours too, Sherry. I categorically refuse to take any responsibility for this situation. Jack, I don't want to get divorced. I'm ready to fight for our marriage. But the reality is that we don't have anything left worth fighting for. I'd rather face death than be tied to you for the rest of my life. Jack, I believe you still have feelings for me too. It's not something that's easy to turn off because of one such case. To be honest, you seem to be completely deluded and disconnected from reality. Did you even bother to read the divorce papers that were handed to you? I doubt it very much. Why should I? Look, if you just listen to reason and give me a chance to fix this, you won't need a divorce. If not for me, then at least for Shelby and Ryan's well-being. They deserve to have both a mother and a father. Remember, we will always be parents to them. If you had taken the time to read it, you would have seen that as long as you agree to joint custody of our children, you can continue to live in the house and receive an equal share of our property. What is not stated in the petition, but I want to make it clear now, is that if you refuse to sign and accept these very favorable terms, I will make the videos of you and your partner available to everyone you have ever known, including your parents, sister, her children, and everyone else I'll be able to remember. Jack, you wouldn't dare. You can't despise me that much. But Sherry, you're wrong about that. I am capable of it, and I have already made a decision. Nothing in this world can stop me. If you challenge me, I will make sure that your life is ruined forever. Trust me, Sherry, I really have that kind of hate. Jack, I'm begging you to change your mind. Please sign the divorce papers, Sherry. Jack, give me a chance to fix this. I'm sorry, but this is not the way out. Sign the papers, Sherry. Oh God, please. Sign the papers, Sherry. And I abruptly cut off the call. After Sherry signed the necessary documents, the divorce process was completed within six months. As a result, she now lives in the house we once shared, along with Shelby and Ryan. Meanwhile, I moved into a condominium a few blocks from home. Fortunately, our children's daily routines have hardly been affected, since we still live in the same school district. 
but the emotional blow of the divorce was obvious to both of them. Shelby confessed to me that their mother had admitted her regrettable mistake by admitting that our marriage had failed to overcome it. Despite this, we assured our children that they can always count on our unwavering support. As for Sherry, I do not know what she could share with her parents and sister about the breakup of our relationship. But since they all keep talking to me, it looks like she didn't tell them that I was to blame. In my mother's eyes, it was just a problem that Sherry and I couldn't forget. Fortunately, I had one last opportunity to pick up the audio recorder from Sherry's car, and the recording of the voice turned out to be very memorable. On the way home, she called Greg and thanked him for a wonderful day. But at the same time, she mentioned that she thought I might have suspicions, and suggested that they take a break for a couple of weeks until she was sure everything was clean. But when she pulled up to the house, she looked puzzled. Curiosity seized her as she watched the crowd of people gathered on the street and fixated on our yard. But as soon as she noticed the signs and photos and realized the scale of my actions, her scream broke the silence. The sounds of her sobbing and repeated questions. What did you do, Jack? What did you do? It sounded in the air as she drove away. It was at this moment that reality hit her like an icy wave, changing her worldview. She was frantically praying to God, desperately asking, Oh my God, what have I done? No, God, please, what have I done? Please, God, make it all disappear. In a serious condition, she managed to contact her lover, and when she heard his voice, she let out a piercing scream. He knows, Greg! It's been over a year since we were engulfed in the flames of hell, and slowly but surely, I'm putting my life back together. Currently, I am still hesitant to start a new romantic relationship and expect this reluctance to persist for some time. Just the thought of reliving what I have recently experienced makes me deeply wary. Shelby confessed to me that her mother once decided to go on a date, but returned home in tears and subsequently, as far as she knows, avoided any romantic relationship. Sherry recently got a job as a secretary at a nursing home, deciding to retire from a realtor's career, at least temporarily. As for her connection with Greg Allen, I don't know if they maintain any form of communication, and frankly, I don't care. It is worth noting that Greg Allen and his wife are no longer together, and he has faced difficulties finding a job. Although I personally did not distribute videos of their intimate moments among Sherry's acquaintances, I must admit that I was not so condescending to Greg. It seems that many companies are hesitant to hire someone with a reputation for having affairs with married women, which could potentially lead to the breakdown of their marriage. In the videos, I blurred Sherry's face while keeping the sound. I recently found out that Greg's ex-wife is in a serious relationship with a kind policeman, and I'm happy for her. In this regard, Greg's previous company made a generous offer to prevent any negative attention, and I accepted it. Right now, I'm focused solely on my children and their future. Perhaps one day my own future will become meaningful to me. She expressed her doubts, but after nine years of marriage and financial stability, and considering that she is already 30 years old, she admitted that time is ticking. I know the clock is ticking, she confirmed, and agreed to move forward. Reflecting on our history, Lisa and I crossed paths shortly after graduating from college. She worked in a cafe where I regularly stopped on my way to work. Instantly charmed, I wasn't confident enough to ask her out until a few months had passed. But when we finally connected, our bond was undeniable, and a year later I proposed to her. Against the backdrop of the charming Florida landscape, our wedding took place as an intimate ceremony at the destination. Surrounded by a select group of dear family members and close friends, the atmosphere was just perfect. In the depths of Lisa's heart, a dream blossomed, to open her own cafe. With unwavering determination, we embarked on a journey along the path of financial prudence, diligently saving every penny in pursuit of this common aspiration. Having decided to postpone the joys of parenthood for a while, we decided to first achieve a semblance of stability. 
Six years have passed, marked by unwavering dedication and unwavering determination. Our savings grew, and we accumulated enough money to purchase a rundown house abandoned by the previous owner. Sweat, perseverance, and countless hours were spent to revive the dilapidated building, turning it into a paradise filled with warmth and atmosphere. Another year was spent on carefully finishing and equipping the room so that every detail would match our vision. Finally, the day came when our cafe opened its doors, welcoming the whole world. At one time, the cafe began to flourish, which forced us to hire additional staff to cope with the growing demand. While I was focusing on my role in information technology, my wife, Lisa, took over the management of the business. We were lucky that we had a backup plan in case the cafe didn't thrive. In the afternoon, I visited Lisa, who often stayed in the cafe for another two hours after closing, doing cleaning, accounting, and other duties. I helped her from time to time before we went home together. Everything was going well until about 18 months ago, our cafe began to work well and make a profit. At that moment, my wife and I decided that it was time to expand our family. I talked to her about it, hoping to start a new chapter in our lives. But over time, I noticed that she never once mentioned her fertile period and made no attempt to initiate intimacy with me. Although I had made attempts to initiate intimacy myself, I wasn't sure if they were successful. It felt more like a duty than an act of love or an attempt to conceive a child. As the month passed, my fears intensified. I recently passed an efficacy test and received a positive result, indicating that I am healthy and have sufficient sperm count for the possibility of a potential pregnancy. In addition, I was lucky enough to receive two promotions, which allowed me to afford high-quality medical care. Considering my readiness for parenthood, I suggested to my partner Lisa to visit a doctor to make sure she is ready for pregnancy. To my surprise, she declined the offer, leaving me in some perplexity and alarm. Is there something I'm not aware of, or is Lisa really not interested in starting a family? Despite initially agreeing with this idea, her actions seemed to indicate the opposite. As a worried spouse, I started another heartfelt conversation while sipping my morning coffee at the breakfast table. Being straightforward, I asked Lisa a direct question. Are we planning to start a family? Despite my efforts, it seems that you are not showing the same determination. If you want to discuss something, now is the time. Lisa sat down in a chair and expressed her concerns. If I get pregnant, who will run the cafe? You have your own job and I appreciate your help. But I'm afraid that when I stop participating in this case, everything may collapse. Usually, people hire someone to help them cope with their responsibilities, and this situation is no different from others. Even if you got pregnant, it's usually only after six months that you'll need significant rest. At this time, you can hire someone and train them for a few months before you take a break. This is standard practice for working women who plan to have children, and you will be no exception. In addition, if necessary, I am ready to leave my job and devote myself entirely to the management of the cafe. Ultimately, I want you to tell me honestly if you want to have a baby, and if you don't, I promise never to bring this up again. I have tried to state my wishes accurately and clearly. Upon hearing this, she accepted my request and assured me that she would explore the possibility of trying to have a child again. Despite her initial agreement, a whole month passed without any further conversation on the subject. Becoming more and more worried, I decided to bring up this topic during the car ride home from the cafe. To my surprise, her reaction was defensive, and she accused me of not paying attention to her emotions. She thought that by asking her to become a mother, I was trying to destroy her dream of running a cafe. I reminded her that she had already agreed to this scenario earlier. Due to the lack of reciprocity in our relationship, I felt dejected. It wasn't just that she didn't agree with my opinion, but that she agreed with me at first, but then reneged on her promises. I even offered to give up the job, but my offer was rejected. This recurring pattern made me realize that I was constantly willing to compromise, while Lisa didn't seem inclined to meet me halfway. I have fully dedicated myself to helping her achieve her desires by going beyond the box, taking extra shifts, 
and working overtime to make my financial contribution. Throughout this process, there were times when I desired something for myself, but willingly sacrificed those desires to save money for her dreams. But the lack of reciprocity in our relationship made me doubt my shared happiness. At first, her willingness to make sacrifices was absent. But to my surprise, a week later, during dinner, she unexpectedly showed a newfound willingness to try. Overwhelmed with excitement, we didn't waste any time and immediately got to work. Unfortunately, after four months of unsuccessful attempts, our mood soured. Having decided to act, I decided to take the initiative and made an appointment with a doctor to undergo a thorough examination, including a sperm analysis. Fortunately, my work benefits allowed me to undergo several free examinations every year. The doctor confirmed that I was healthy and everything was fine on my part. It was not an easy task to start a conversation about Lisa's possible fertility problems. I wanted to approach this topic in a way that didn't make her feel insulted or responsible. It wasn't easy, but one evening, when we were lying in bed, I plucked up the courage and touched on this topic in a gentle way. Instead of pointing the finger, I took the blame on myself, suggesting that I should visit the doctor again, even though I had already done so. Lisa in turn reassured me, emphatically stating that everything was fine and reminding me that some couples just need time. Hoping to believe her words, I decided to be patient. After conducting extensive research, it turned out that for some couples, conceiving a child can take several years. This new knowledge has instilled doubts in the depths of my consciousness. But I made a conscious decision to ignore these doubts and be patient. At first, everything went smoothly for about a month, and I made an effort to stay calm. As a rule I wake up late, and Lisa leaves early to open the cafe at 6 a.m. According to my daily routine, I got ready and left early enough to stop by the cafe and see Lisa before going to work. But this morning, when I was just doing my business in the bathroom, I felt that the trash can had exhausted its volume and it urgently needed to be emptied. Grabbing the bag I proceeded to dispose of its contents. But what I came across completely shocked me. Inside, I found an empty birth control pill card, and this caused a wave of anxiety in my entire being. Carrying the disturbing find with me, I headed into the bedroom, where my gaze fell on the ring lying on the bedside table. Strangely, for the first time, I hesitated to put it back on my finger. Instead, I took the birth control card along with my work bag and started getting ready. The trip to the cafe seemed unbearably long and painful to me. When I drove up to the store, my mind was filled with various thoughts. I was trying to decipher the possible motives for Lisa's recent action. Maybe she has an undisclosed medical problem that I'm not aware of. In search of clarity, I decided to leave work early and meet her at a cafe. But when I got to the cafe, I was faced with the annoying problem of finding a suitable parking spot. As I continued to drive past the cafe in search of a parking spot, my anticipation grew. Driving past the back of the cafe, I noticed a man talking to her. At first, I thought it was a worker or a courier, but to my horror, they exchanged a short and unexpected kiss. Lisa quickly entered the cafe and the man left. I was at a loss trying to make sense of the situation. I kept driving until I got home, and then a sudden realization hit me. Perhaps she was taking birth control pills to avoid the possibility of getting pregnant by another man. This revelation shocked me, and it took me a whole hour to come to my senses and think about my future desires. It would be useless to resist Lisa. She deceived me about wanting to have a child and taking pills. My trust in her has been undermined. Besides, without concrete evidence, I couldn't accuse her of infidelity. So. I decided to take matters into my own hands. Determined to get to the bottom of it, I wasted no time looking for a private investigator. I eventually came across Roger Clifford, a former law enforcement officer who agreed to take on my case. Doubting my resolve, he asked, Are you really serious about this case? I have witnessed countless people abandoning an investigation halfway through out of fear, trying to avoid painful consequences. Although the pain was only temporarily suppressed, 
My main concern was to find out the identity of this person and the duration of their relationship. I have stated with conviction that I am not a weak person. I just need an excuse for the upcoming actions. I do not intend to get involved in a conflict that I am doomed to lose. After settling the payment issue and providing all the necessary details, I left. Wanting to be alone to clear my head, I went for a long walk. When I returned, Lisa was already at home. She asked me why I didn't go to the cafe in the evening. I replied that I was not feeling well. Realizing that it would be best to rest and recuperate, I decided to go for the night. She refrained from asking any further questions. Over the next week, I deliberately avoided her and did my best to stay in the office as long as possible. I left early and returned late, seeking solace in my bed, where I slept deeply, almost as if unconscious. After seven days, the investigator called me to a meeting. After greeting me warmly, Roger offered me a glass of Jack Daniel's whiskey, which I hastily drank before taking my seat. Then he handed me a folder which I looked through carefully. It contained information about Jason Martin, Lisa's former classmate who, as it turned out, was involved in Lisa's betrayal. The last time they were close was at the Riverside Motel. I'm sorry, but she is unfaithful to you. The folder contains all the evidence you will need to prove her infidelity in court. I was silent, feeling numb. There was no sadness, no anger, just emptiness. After a few minutes, I stood up, shook Roger's hand, and expressed my gratitude. When I returned home, I anxiously waited for Lisa's arrival. When she came in, I found myself in the kitchen, mentally preparing for the difficult conversation ahead. Let's talk. I offered her a steaming cup of coffee and invited her to sit down. Please, let's not discuss pregnancy today, she pleaded, feeling exhausted and not ready for such a conversation. Hesitating, she reluctantly sank into a chair. We won't bring up the subject of pregnancy anymore, because you've already made up your mind, I assured her, mentioning the effective prescription that Dr. Jackson gave. I took an empty birth control card out of my bag and put it on the table, which caused her surprise and discomfort. I found it in the trash in the bathroom, and since no one else is in the house, it should belong to you, I explained. After finding out, I found out that you sought medical help to prevent pregnancy. Let me be blunt, I'm only here to find out the truth and make your excuses useless. I was only worried about the well-being of our cafe, not about the prospect of having children. She confessed, prompting me to ask, So did you not want children at all, or just with Jason? There was contempt in my tone. Shocked, she covered her mouth with her hand and gasped, tears streaming down her face. You're manipulating me into thinking that I don't want to have children with you. You're a terrible person. I love you and would never betray you. Let me illustrate the actions of an unscrupulous woman. I spread out pictures of Lisa and Jason together, without clothes, in a motel. This, my dear, is an example of disgusting human behavior. This person not only deceived her husband, but also broke marital promises by entering into an extramarital affair. It is precisely such actions that define a truly disgusting personality. Oh no, that can't be true. You invaded my privacy wanting to confuse me. You're the one showing disgusting traits. Overwhelmed with disappointment, I impulsively threw a coffee mug in her direction, even though I knew it wouldn't hurt her. But despite this, it served as a clear signal of my displeasure. I looked into her eyes, carefully taking the coffee mug out of her hands, successfully avoiding any mishaps. The next mug I was aiming at had to find its target, too. When she turned her head, the coffee mug collided with her photo hanging on the wall and spilled. In a stern tone, I urged her to admit the truth, promising leniency. Lisa tearfully claimed that it was an accident and that the man named Jason was just an old school friend going through a difficult period. She insisted that their relationship was not destined to develop. But when I asked about the duration of their relationship, she reluctantly admitted that several months of deception and insulting betrayal. Rage and irritation gripped me as I slammed my clenched fist down on the table. 
It took a full five minutes for my emotions to subside. Pointing with a stern finger, I announced, All your things have been moved to the basement. Under no circumstances are you allowed to approach me or enter my sacred space unless I give you permission to do so. Is that clear to you? She nodded in agreement. Determined, I turned to my lawyer for advice the next day, outlining my intentions in detail. Over the next three days, I specifically looked for excuses to be away from home, giving my lawyer enough time to draft the divorce papers. Finally, on Friday, I presented her with the completed documents, which completely confused her. I expected that I would have to endure your unpleasant company in this house next to me. Many people have successfully overcome similar difficulties, so I ask you to think about giving us a chance. I even express my willingness to have children with you, begging you not to leave me. But it all looks like a joke. Seriously, having children with you? I'd rather marry a pig than have children with you. Now please pay attention to what I'm about to say. I have clearly formulated my requirements. We have to sell the cafe and split the profits. Lisa objected, expressing a desire to keep it for herself. But I insist that I want to take it for myself. Of course, if you really want to retain ownership, we can consider other options. I expect a full refund of the entire amount that I originally invested, considering that I have invested a significant part, about 70% of the total expenses, including the purchase of equipment and furniture, it would be fair if you compensate me while retaining ownership of the cafe. After I've done so much to help you achieve your dream but faced betrayal, I believe I have the right to what is rightfully mine. I made it clear that I would not compromise and left the room. To be honest, I confided in one of the cafe's employees, an acquaintance of mine, and asked him about my wife's infidelity. He admitted that he harbored suspicions because he noticed Jason's repeated visits to the cafe and Lisa's special attitude towards him, surpassing that of other regular customers. Despite his awareness, he made a conscious decision not to voice his concerns, realizing that it was not his place to interfere in our personal affairs. His only desire was to keep his job, and I couldn't blame him for that. He just wanted to avoid getting involved in a difficult situation. The following week, Lisa's alleged legal representative contacted my lawyer and outlined her conditions. In exchange for everything else, she demanded sole ownership of the cafe. Although the offer seemed attractive to me, I couldn't forget how she betrayed my trust. Therefore, I have come to the conclusion that she deserves nothing. To fend off her conditions, I instructed my lawyer to reject them, fully prepared to confront her in court. As I left the office and headed home, I mentally prepared for the upcoming legal battle. The next day, my mother contacted me and asked me to visit her. Since she lived nearby, it wasn't too inconvenient. Since I got married, my mom has lived alone since my father died of a heart attack when I was in college. Even if mom received a pension and the house was fully paid for, it was still not enough to fulfill all her financial obligations and buy groceries every month. When I had the opportunity, I contributed money, paying tribute to the sacrifices my mother made to provide for me, especially during the difficult period after college, when I was trying to find my footing. When I got to her house, she was already waiting for me on the porch. I joined her and asked about her needs. Are you filing for divorce? What is it? She asked. Yes, I replied. Has Lisa contacted you? Jesus asked for forgiveness. You have to forgive her and move on, my mother insisted, in which her traditional beliefs were vividly manifested. She stressed that in our family it is customary to fight for marriage and never give up, regardless of difficulties. I couldn't help but feel a surge of disappointment, and my eyes involuntarily rolled back. Deep down, I understood that many members of my mother's family remain trapped without love and unhappy unions and all because of their unwavering rejection of divorce. It was unpleasant for me to watch some of them endure constant insults, infidelity, and even hidden families. It seemed absurd to me that they were creating an image of blameless, pious Christians, despite their true nature. I had no desire to imitate them, and certainly did not want to expose myself to their misfortune. 
My mom suggested seeking help by offering to take couples therapy or try to establish communication and solve our problems. She informed me that during their conversation, Lisa looked regretful and expressed a desire to avoid a divorce. In response, I rolled my eyes again, convinced that Lisa's only concern was around the cafe. To reassure my mother, I reluctantly promised to consider her suggestions. But my true feelings were completely the opposite. I had no desire to give Lisa any leeway. I had already made it clear to her that I would obey any decision that the judge would make in court. But I was not going to give in to her requests, as I had done countless times before. This time, my priority was my own well-being. Most recently, my mother contacted me and informed me about her constant computer problems. This was nothing new, since she does not know how to use a computer and mainly uses it to work with social networks and email. This situation occurs every few months. I had to stop by her house to sort out the files and sort out the excessive number of photos she downloads from Facebook. It seems that she often forgets about them until her computer's memory is overloaded and starts to malfunction. Therefore, I decided to clean up the mess by deleting all the unnecessary photos and files that have accumulated over the past few months. Having successfully freed up memory space, I did a little check to make sure everything was working correctly. When I launched the web browser, her email suddenly appeared, which attracted my attention with the ongoing email conversations between her and Lisa. It was an interesting discovery. I'm usually not inclined to mind my own business, and if these email conversations had been conducted three or four months ago, I wouldn't have paid attention to them, considering that this was before the divorce even occurred to me. But there were more recent reports here, even the day before. It made me wonder why my mother would associate with a woman who betrayed her own son. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to look into the email correspondence, starting to scroll through the messages. I ventured back to the moment when Lisa confessed that she had started a relationship with Jason, and what I discovered left me completely unprepared. It turned out that Lisa had entrusted her most intimate secrets to my mother. She confessed to me that she made a mistake and slept with an old friend. Overcome with fear that I would find out the truth, she asked my mother for advice on what to do. To my surprise, my mother reacted dismissively, downplaying the significance of the situation and stating that people in relationships often feel curious. To my amazement, she even admitted that she had cheated on a man named Dan several times with a man, justifying her actions by saying that since her father never found out, it was quite acceptable. My mother seemed to be sure that I would not leave Lisa because of the significant emotional and financial investments I had made in our marriage. She made the crucial mistake of deciding that my father would never leave her. Understanding my father's character as a devoted family man who does not tolerate nonsense, I admitted that he would immediately take action and file for divorce if he found out about her infidelity. Although family meant everything to him, he did not want to remain trapped in a toxic marriage, and I shared this opinion. As I continued to look through the documents, I came across evidence that my father had indeed initiated the divorce proceedings. Unfortunately, his untimely death due to a heart attack did not allow him to complete it. Unfortunately, my mother's actions played a role in his demise. I found out that Lisa transferred money to my mother on a monthly basis, which apparently came from the cafe. This discovery shed light on my mother's ulterior motives, described in the emails. Money was more important to her than our relationship. Filled with anger, I quickly downloaded the entire stream of emails and forwarded it to my lawyer to consult about its potential usefulness. Although the deadlines were tight, the lawyer assured me that he would explore the possibility of using it. To my amazement, the chain of letters contained Lisa's confession of an extramarital affair. The divorce proceedings were only two weeks away, and I was looking forward to getting rid of this ongoing nightmare. As for Lisa, her future remained uncertain. I do not know what position she is in right now. The judge told her to close the store so I could sell it. When I passed by last week, I noticed that the windows were dark, 
which suggests that she at least complied with the judge's order. Although I thought I might feel a certain amount of sympathy if she lost the store, instead I was overcome by hatred for her. It's hard to feel sorry for someone who has caused me such deep pain, even on a simple human level. When she started crying during the courtroom scene, I just shook my head, thinking about my paternal family. Their help has been invaluable throughout this journey. Their unwavering support was truly amazing, and some even generously offered me to stay with them until I could get back on my feet. But now I find solace in being independent. So I asked them for help in finding affordable housing so that I wouldn't have to sacrifice everything. The turmoil surrounding my divorce has subsided, but there are still two crucial chapters that require my attention. First, I sued Jason for alienation of affection, revealing the intricate details of his affair to my work colleagues. Despite the fact that Lisa was not my colleague, I had no hopes for her. In addition, I was shocked when I discovered that I had sent the fee to his wife, who was already planning to file for divorce, citing adultery as the reason. In addition, I made an important decision. I stopped providing financial support to my mother. I usually sent her money at the end of each month. When she realized that the money was missing from her account, she turned to me with a question about the whereabouts of the money. Where's the money, Mike? What is it? She asked. Confused, I replied, What kind of money? You mean the monthly allowance? Have I forgotten? I didn't forget. I just assumed that since Lisa is already paying you, then my payment is unnecessary. But she doesn't pay me any compensation. So in this situation, you have to find a way to provide your mother with a pension. She tried to object, but I interrupted her and pointed out that she had decided to support Lisa, not her own son. She tried to explain that she only cared about my well-being, hoping to save me from a bitter divorce at a young age. But by that time, her explanations no longer mattered to me. I suggested that she turn to Lisa for financial help, given their strong friendship, although perhaps this was a somewhat malicious remark on my part. But I didn't care about the consequences. She claimed that she had not received any messages from Lisa after the judge's decision, which was unfortunate for her, since she would not receive any financial assistance from me. I politely wished her luck, which infuriated her. She called me an ungrateful and despicable son, comparing me to her other nephews who supposedly treat their mother better. To counter her arguments, I advised her to seek help from her nephews, as they are considered good boys. She started begging me, trying to manipulate me with the help of the mother card. But in this situation, it was not about that. I challenged her, expressing the belief that she did not have a good character. A truly virtuous person would never encourage my wife to betray. Indulging in forbidden pleasures is one thing, but it is very important not to let it be known. Now she understands that I know about her betrayal. Remembering Jesus' teaching about forgiveness, I advised her to turn to him for absolution. I made it clear that I did not want to be contacted again and quickly ended the conversation. But it didn't end there. The next day, messages from relatives from my mother's side poured into my phone, demanding an explanation of the situation. It turns out that my mother is spreading malicious and untrue rumors about our situation, falsely claiming that I turned her off because she became a burden to me. In response, I decided to send a threatening email to everyone who contacted me through messages or calls. As a result, the family seems to be divided. Half supports me, and the other half supports my mother. As a result, I am not allowed to attend various events such as birthdays, weddings, and family barbecues. But I sincerely do not object to such consequences. I realize that this part of my family is toxic, and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. My previous tolerance was solely due to the presence of my mother, but now that I have decided to cut off contact with her, I see no reason to continue communicating with them. I don't have to put up with their presence anymore. After completing the course of therapy, my mood improved significantly. To ensure friendly communication, I decided to take two large German shepherds into my life. I took them from the local shelter center, where they were just days away from being euthanized if I hadn't intervened. 
At first I doubted them, but they turned out to be absolutely incredible. The highlight of my day is returning home, where I am showered with copious kisses and licks. I think I've discovered the beauty of unconditional love. To all of you, my dear listeners.